and Well, thank you everyone to the Willard Neighborhood December uh, virtual meeting. I think we're now a, a full year of, of virtual meetings. Um, so it's nice, you know, it's chilly outside. I think the, the storm is about to hit. So it's nice to be indoors for this, but it is our hope that starting um, in, you know, next year, probably not January, but starting in February, March, we may move to in-person, but for the most part, these virtual meetings are nice because it gives folks, um, a few folks a chance to participate. Uh, so we'll do a little bit of housekeeping first. Let's see if this advances. Okay, so are, there are different ways to participate. Um, you can raise your hand if you have a comment uh, and you do that, uh, if you see the bars at the bottom, you press the button and it'll alert us that you would like to give a comment. Um, and throughout the meeting, we'll, we'll give folks an opportunity to comment. And then you can also type a question in the chat box and Margarita and I will be monitoring that. And if you are dialing in, uh, just you can press star nine to raise your hand or star nine to unmute uh, your mic while, while during the meeting. And also we do have Spanish translation um, Margarita, would you like to explain? Yes, that? yes. Um, para los que ocupan traducción en español, uh, pueden mirar en la pantalla el globito que pueden seleccionar y así pueden escoger la idioma de español para obtener el servicio de interpretación en español. Si me pueden mandar un mensaje en el chat, si ocupan traducción en español, le, se les agradecería. So I'm just saying if they can, um, if they need interpreting to let me know on the chat, that way I can turn it on. Okay, great. And I know we have a few um, neighbors that we're going to be calling in, um, but before we get started, just wanted to remind everyone on uh, how to connect with our organization. We are a group of volunteer neighbors that formed this association to focus on issues and, and uh, ways that we can be as work as a community for the Willard neighborhood. And you can connect with us through social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, pretty regularly we, we post on there. On Nextdoor, that's another great way to stay connected because it's you geographically connects us. Um, and then through Gmail, and uh, we also have a call-in line. Uh, but because we are a volunteer organization, um, we do encourage everyone to participate uh, either at one of our events um, during these calls, monthly calls, or if you would like to be a part of the board or help in some of our planning, we, we definitely welcome that. We're all a group of volunteers. And uh, to kick it off, just wanted to remind everybody our mission and, and goal of our group is to make our neighborhood better through safety, beautification, and community activities. So this is our guiding principle and helps guide us so that we stay focused on um, what's important for our community. Um, and let's see, before we get started, I do want to recognize uh, we have a special guest, Frank Oriano, from, um, I think it's Public Safety Department, right? Traffic okay. Engineering, yes. In Traffic Engineering. So he's a senior traffic engineer with the City of Santa Ana. So in just a few moments, we will get started. And uh, we're very excited to uh, have a lot of interest from neighbors on public safety is with special regard to traffic and, and pedestrian safety. So we will... Um, start that one moment. Just wanted to give everybody a uh, reminder about a very important event we have coming up this weekend, this Saturday, a very exciting event. Um, St. Peter Lutheran Church has been one of our early supporters. They helped uh, kick off one of our uh, a youth event that we had this summer. And for the holidays, they asked us to support them with their live nativity scene and uh, candle lighting uh, festivity that they have this Saturday. It will be from five to eight. So we are a co-sponsor for this. 
uh, but we are asking for volunteers to help us out with uh, in some of the many areas. We'll be setting up at about two o'clock and we are sponsoring uh, some of the treats that we'll be sharing with everybody, Champurrado. Uh, Favi Silva's mom is making that. We're super excited about that. And, and thank you, Favi, and thank your mom for making the Champurrado. Uh, we'll have coffee and pan dulce and super happy to report that um, Miss Gay Olivos, who's one of our board members, reached out to Big Saver Foods and they are very graciously going to uh, sponsor some of the pan dulce. And so we hope that that's the first of many um, partnerships that we do with Big Saver. They, as part of their mission statement, like to connect with their local community. So we hope that uh, we'll be working with them again soon. Uh, gifts for the kids. Uh, we received a donation this summer of really beautiful water bottles um, that, that are very high quality, double insulated from the company Swell. So we'll, we'll give those to the kids as gifts. And then uh, there is a live nativity scene. And a new thing that we're doing is we will be sponsoring the petting zoo. So we'll have some live animals in the manger, which we think that the kids will be very excited about. Lastly, another thing we're hosting is the El Sol Academy. Uh, their Ballet Flocorico group will be performing. Uh, that's uh, something that Miss Gate coordinated. So that'll be part of the entertainment along with holiday music and candle lighting. So at a minimum, please plan to stop by and uh, enjoy the, the festivities. But if you are available to help out, we could use your help anywhere from starting at 2 p.m. until the event and then, and then for cleanup. Any questions or comments? Okay. Great, so let's get started um, talking about traffic safety. So at our last meeting, we um, placed special focus on different committees. And one committee that was of uh, quite a bit of interest for a few neighbors was traffic safety. And so we talked with uh, the city about some ideas on how to really focus our efforts and, and get, get some uh, things changed within our community. And so they connected us with uh, Mr. Frank Oriano, who's joining us today, senior traffic engineer for the city of Santa Ana. And uh, just to give a little bit of background, you know, our community is so unique to others that are neighboring from Floral Park to Washington Square. We have a high number of pedestrians, bicyclists, and uh, non-local traffic. So, you know, folks trying to get down to the courthouse. It's interesting, when I have uh, new friends come and visit me, they say, oh my gosh, there's so many people walking on the street. And I tell them, I love that because there's such a big community and you know everyone's always like, good evening, good evening and what, saying hi to each other. And I think it's a beautiful thing to have so many pedestrians within our neighborhood, but, but that makes us have some uh, special concerns. So we, we as neighbors feel that there are more safety measures that we urgently need in our neighborhood. Um, just within our boundaries, it's about a one mile uh, boundary. We have thousands of, it's actually 10,000 students, parents, children walking to and from school, daycare centers, and many, many businesses. Everything from a bank to uh, OSHA and, and restaurants. And, and then again, folks coming down to the civic center area. So um, we had two uh, community events recently. One was a uh, fall festival at St. Peter that we participated in. And another was our dumpster cleanup day. And at those two community events, we asked neighbors, what were the most areas of concern? And this is what um, they reported back. And we had like a map that they kind of circled and, and um, noted everyone, a lot of comments came back about, you know, we need more parking. So that's definitely one area of concern. Uh, but what I highlighted here are, are the hot spots, if you will, that, that were pointed out. Um, so one area are cars speeding down Parton, um, specifically from 17th Street going down to Civic Center. And while we don't have the data collected here, you know, we assume a lot of that is folks trying to get to the Civic Center or avoid some of the traffic that's on Flower. Uh, also, the area on Ross from Washington to Civic Center, 
uh, and 15th Street to Broadway was a big area of concern. Uh, another area of concern was uh, cars doing donuts, specifically on Parton Street uh, and 10th. So that's the circle at the bottom half. And Bianca, that's that's uh, close to where you live. Do you want do you want to add some comments there? Let's see. We can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, her mic is not working, Irene. Okay, so um, Bianca has mentioned, especially in the evenings and weekends, um, even though it's, it, it's a four-way stop sign area, constantly there, there are vehicles doing donuts there at, at all hours of the night. So um, that's an area of concern. And in general, you know, we, we have quite a few intersections where we have four-way stop signs and cars are not making complete stops. And again, going back to the fact that we have so many pedestrians, that's an area of concern. Specifically, the intersection of Parton and 15th, we have um, unfortunately had some fatalities there in that specific intersection. So with that, um, I wanted to open it up. Um, Mr. Ariana, would, would you like to give any comments or would you like to hear a bit from some of our neighbors on any anecdotal or, or thoughts that they had? I'd rather hear from the neighbors. That way, we can tie in what you have on your on um, that sure. you're presenting on the screen, and okay. then maybe we can mesh it together. That way, we're not answering the same question twice or something like that. Oh, Irene, I just wanted to read the chat um, by Bianca. She's just emphasizing living on the corner of Tenth and Parton, and there are donuts all of the time, but the hours are from nine to eleven p.m. Yeah, that's great to know. It's interesting that these issues are happening at there. Not only is it different hotspots, but different times of the day. So we'll take uh, raise your hand, please, if you would like to add a comment or, or give any additional anecdotal, and we will call on you. Can you hear me now? Yes, hi, Bianca. Hi. Um, all right, I just, I'm calling in from my phone. It might be easier because I don't know why my other one wasn't working. Um, we live right on the corner of 10th and Parton. So we hear all the speeding as they're heading toward Civic Center. And um, I'm always nervous when they're doing the donuts. There's so many neighbors who park on the street because like you said, parking is an issue. Um, I'm so afraid that one of our, one of the cars is going to be hit one of these times. Um, so it, it's typically at night. I know Santa Ana PD has been really great. Every time we have a meeting, they come out and they, they watch. And I don't know if the people, um, just watch for the police and, and watch when they leave and then they do donuts. I don't know exactly how that happens, but it seems that every time, um, the police leave is when the donut starts. So it's just, it's scary. We have, we have a lot of kids who live in the neighborhood who ride bikes, who ride skateboards. And I'm just so fearful that one of them is going to get hit one of these nights. It, it terrifies me. No, I, I can imagine. So definitely that that's an area of concern that we need to focus on. Thank you, Bianca. Okay. Next, uh, Marta, raise your hand. You have a question? you have a comment? Hi, I just wanted to share how I work at St. Peter Lutheran Church at the corner of uh, 15th and Parton and how often during the day I see people roll just do a rolling stop right in, right in front of that Willard playground. Um, either a rolling stop or literally just fly through. Um, so I think that maybe a stop sign on the on the ground is needed. Maybe those, you know, lines um, need to be a little bit clearer or painted. Uh, it's a really old corner, so it just needs a little bit more attention so that the cars don't fly through that intersection. Thank you, Marta. Let's see, uh, Chris. 
Welcome, Chris. Do you have a comment? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I, I guess wanted to make a couple comments. Um, I think on Washington Avenue, um, it's just generally very potholed. Just the road conditions are really, really rough um, throughout uh, most of Washington um, from between Broadway and Flower. Um, so I think just, uh, I'm, I'm a regular cyclist. And so it's one of those things where it's just, I'm always, I, I literally hit a pothole and that one day I didn't have enough air in my tire and I got a flat tire. So it's just one of those things where it's just, uh, imagine it's a liability issue, but also it's just a safe riding kind of issue for, for cyclists. Um, um, I was curious because I know that the city has done a lot of work around putting traffic circles um, or roundabouts in, in residential neighborhoods like on Pacific, um, you know, and this area, you know, is basically surrounded by huge streets. So it me makes sense that traffic will, fast traffic from major streets will spill over into the neighborhood. So it kind of makes sense to maybe do something like that or speed humps or even traffic circles and traffic circles could basically be in the intersection and actually like discourage that, um, those donuts um, and, and, and just narrowing kind of crossing points at intersection. So I'd be curious of if uh, traffic circles or anything like that would be considered in this area. Um, and speed humps where maybe they don't work. Um, I think that probably is it. I think the only other thing I would say, like I, I live off of Broadway and um, I think speeding, I basically will either get woken up by, a, uh, woken up or just kind of reflect like, oh, there's another fast uh, speeding car down the block. So I think it's just one of those things too, where, um, you know, traffic does move really fast on that street. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, speeding definitely is still a really big issue, I imagine, on, on some of the bigger streets, especially on Broadway. Um, so definitely could look to see what kind of, kind of solutions could come out of that. Um, I guess the only, I had one last thing, um, I'd be curious, you know, so Washington, it seems like it, on the north side of the street, doesn't have parking allowed. And I imagine that's because maybe freight trucks kind of need to pass through, maybe to pass through Willard, uh, to access Willard and drop off. Because I've seen like food trucks, the trucks actually drop off food. Um, at, I imagine their lunches at Willard School. But, you know, I'm, I'm curious if it's ever been considered to put like a bike lane on Washington or, um, or even actually street parking on that north side because then you're actually pinching the roadway to actually make people will have to squeeze through, but they're going to be more aware of needing to, to kind of be even more careful if they're actually doing that. Like I said, it, it's probably be a little bit uncomfortable. So I'd be curious if that's ever been considered though. So that's my last thought. Thank you. Thank I you. Do, sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one other thing and Frank, this may not even be, this may be more of a police issue than a traffic safety issue, but um, the streets here at Willard are pretty narrow. Uh, it's an older neighborhood, and so I imagine nobody thought that there would be this many cars, especially parked on both sides of the street. But we often, especially in front of apartments, and I'm not saying that other than just stating a fact, um, not pointing fingers or anything, uh, we have a lot of cars who just stop. Uh, I don't know if they're food delivery or they're picking people up or dropping people off or whatever, but there's not enough room for them to pull over to the curb. And so they just stop in the middle of the road. And when you've got cars on both sides that are parked and then you have someone stopped in the middle of the road, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for a car to pass through. And my husband drives a pretty big Ford truck. And oftentimes when cars are stopped, either letting someone out or picking someone up, um, we're nervous we're going to hit either the car that stopped or a parked car because the streets are so narrow. Again, this may not be a traffic issue. It may be a police issue where we just need more patrol uh, to ticket people who are stopping. Um, but it is an issue in the neighborhood for sure. And if I may answer that one really, really quick. Um, it, it is a PV issue. Um, one way we can automate, and I hate to say it this way, the citations that can facilitate PD to go out there and make things 
or get everybody to understand that if they stay in that lane, it, it becomes a problem, not just for you guys driving, but themselves. And a simple way to do that is we, we put a double yellow down the middle of the roadway. So by putting that double yellow and they're obstructing that lane, it's a clear violation of it where if it's just an open road, no lane designation, PD can say, well, you could go around. Well, on Washington, you don't just want to go around because there's multiple streets in the area and then people come in um, sometimes at a relatively fast speed, but let's say they're going 25 miles an hour. Now you have to get on one side of the street, look at the roadways that are feeding into Washington as you're doing that move, it's just unsafe. Now, even if I put that down the line, it still becomes a PV problem, but it makes it easier then for them to cite. If a car is there stopped with their flashing um, lights on for an emergency, that's not picking people up. That's the, the, the emergency lights aren't for pick up, drop off, or buying you know, a quick um, palette on the way or something like that. It's, it's an emergency. And if you don't have one, then you should be cited for it. And well, the easiest way to do that is we help PD by doing those double yellows. So as we move on with the neighborhood, we'll try and figure out where those areas are that are causing most problem. And if it is around the apartments, I believe we have dotted or dashed lines out there that allow you to go over, just like changing a lane. In this case, if we put double yellows, it doesn't allow you, the person behind the car, to go over. That makes it, like I said, a straight violation for the person that stops there. And it'll be something where, and in, in all these, where whatever the timing that's occurring, that we'll share that with PD as we do the studies or we talk about it. And as well as we'll ask you guys to call PD to make sure that they understand it's coming from you and from us at the same time. So yeah. I just wanna answer that one real quick because it is a bigger issue, but it's a quick solution that we can perform. It's just, we gotta get, we can't do double yellows everywhere, but in the spots that are the most um, notorious, I'll say it that way, those are the ones we can attack first. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I understand why they do it, but it, it, it makes me nervous. Um, and I'm just afraid if I go around, you know, I mean, and I'm not the only one that has to go around. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. And Mr. Oriano is one, um, definitely I think the goal of this is to explore uh, the best solution for our particular neighborhood. Could another option be looking at creating, and I don't know if we have the space for this, but creating some uh, pickup and I think it's it's a yellow code, right? On the curb for pickup and drop off. Creating yes. things like that. We, we, we could do that. Um, and, and that becomes a very organized solution. And what I mean by that is whoever that yellow curve is going to be in front of, you know, has to get deeply involved with the process because it could be something where it's destroying their parking for, let's say, a resident that might be living, that goes to work at night, but needs the parking during the day. So all these have to be factored out. And if it's be spot specific, we don't have a problem that we just have to involve all the stakeholders, which would be everybody that lives. And I'll just, for example, say in front of an apartment, we'll use We'll talk to them saying what, what's needed that helps them make their lives a little bit better and allows for the traffic to flow. So it's that balance that we'll have with each other on that. So yeah, we can do that, but there's no problem. It's just as long as we have all the stakeholders on the table talking about it and everything. It just takes one person to complain. Well, they never called me. Well, we'll, we'll do our best to get out there and call. Margarita helps with that. Other departments help with that. And we even, sometimes we'll close the roadway down, literally close the street down with police out. We'll put a table out there and we'll call everybody out. So we'll go that far to get the message out. So hopefully we don't do it during winter or the cold days, but but we we're willing to do that to just make sure it makes the area that not just the area, but your, your neighborhood as a whole work function better and stuff. And we have a comment from Officer Prieto um, just reminding everyone that it takes a team effort and community collaboration with the Santa Ana PD and to um, please call. Um, the police department where there is a traffic hazard in the area um, and their non-emergency line is in the chat. Okay, any other comments? Um, when, let me go to the next page. So Mr. Ariana, we, we definitely wanted to explore some possible solutions we have seen work in other neighborhoods and then 
um, you can let us know. And of course, not all of these, we, we don't have to go through them all today, but maybe some guiding next steps on how we can focus more on, on what are those top priorities. Uh, but some solutions we've seen in other areas are the speed pads. Um, consider those for possibly Parton and Ross. Um, one neighbor requested stop signs for children crossing Ross into Halesworth. At a minimum, uh, slow yellow signs or, or school crossing signs because a lot of the kids on the west side of Willard are crossing over to El Sol Academy and that's a big concern. Um, and then looking at those roundabouts uh, intersections for some of the more high traffic areas. So all those are doable. And the way I, and the reason I say that up front, they're doable is because they can all possibly with the studies fit those locations. It, and, and I'll take a little bit of step back. You mentioned earlier about a traffic committee. Do you have a traffic committee that's been established? Because um, if it has, it makes our job easy because they collect all the information from all the whole neighborhood. Instead of having like 15, 30, 50 neighbors calling us and everything and trying us to prioritize for you, it's the committee can do that itself and, and work with us and say, okay, there's five, six of us representing the neighborhood um, and we bring different, you know, different problems from different parts of the neighborhood, but we set out and these are the top three or four priorities that we're looking at to address right now. And then that way it gives me a better idea of what the community is saying, because a, much, a lot of these requests we have gotten, we have responded to individual residents. We've done like, let's say um, the radar trailers to slow down speed. We've done other things, but that doesn't necessarily cohesively answer all your problems. It could be a spot check here, then it moves over. If we were to get a community to say like, like the map that you showed earlier right here, where it says, you know, these spots were having the problems on this quarter, we have a problem. If that's a consensus, we can attack those first as we look at what this will affect the rest of the neighborhood. So it's it's basically a neighborhood priority. Um, and we're not saying that one or two people can say, this is what I want and only what I want. It has to be something where the neighborhood, the committee talks and brings it back to the neighborhood saying, look, we have 15, 20, 30 priorities. We're not gonna get to them all. We can get to maybe five or six, which are the top five or six for the neighborhood. And some of those we'll do on our own if they're low lying fruit, uh, you know, to, to Christopher's um, um, discussion about Washington. Washington is, is not wide enough to hold parking on both sides. That's why you see it offset with parking on one side and it's favored at least where the school's at, it's favored on the residential side for parking. But he brought up the biking part. That's not to say we can't put that as a shared road. I don't know if it's designated Washington as a shared road um, area. I believe it is, but I'll have to check on that. If it is, then you'll see those green stencils go out there with the bike, the biker on top. And that means that now it's a shared road for bicyclists as well. Um, and then I'll touch real quick on the potholing. That's a bigger ticket item. I'll check with our design group on that and then I'll get back to the, the residents. And I'll do that for the whole neighborhood. We'll, we'll, we'll do a real quick spot check and check on uh, and get back to you on that one. But, but going back to that priority, if let's say we need to put in more parking out there, we can look for that, but we're, we're limited by spatial requirements. Now, I did hear you know, uh, Bianca say that it's hard to get through there. I'll be honest with you, it's music to my ears that it's very difficult to get through because that slows everybody down, but it's an artificial slowing down that we need to be able to control and we don't want that. We wanna make sure it's, it's it's done in a way that it just gets your, it, it helps you guys in your neighborhood. It's not forced on you by someone else. So, but we'll balance those out. So if there isn't a traffic committee, I, we can still work with the whole, you know, whoever wants to call us in, um, we will prioritize as it comes in. Like, let's say if I get five or six people at one location, then we'll, okay, five people called in versus two over here. But we could probably say, well, the one over here that only one or two called in is a worse item to look at, and we should, but then five people are here over here screaming at me going, no, I want it over here. So it, it is a balancing act, and we try to capture all that. Some of these are, are, are going to be tough to get in only because the fire department requires us or asks of us not to put too many, like if we put speed humps everywhere, then they may not get to your house in case of fire. God forbid there's a fire, but 
if there is, then there are um, equations that we run through that says, okay, if they come from this station, this station, this station, does it slow them down in the response time? So we look at all these items and we try to fit them all together. If they all work, then we start putting them in to make sure as long as we can warrant them, and that's the other key. Um, I know people say, well, you're, you're gonna wait till somebody dies. We're pretty proactive in what we're doing, um, but there are things that the vehicle code says I have to do. With that said, you know, it's just a matter of us getting data and proving that there's that problem that's there. Now, donuts, stuff like that, there's nothing in the vehicle code that says that. I mean, hopefully you call them, PD catches them, but there's ways to obstruct that as you guys seen in other locations in Miami. Now, those, the only reason we put those in is when it's egregious donuts, speeding, and then the combination of pedestrians in the area. So here on Washington, if let's say, and I know it's a little bit lower, but let's say Washington Park and somebody was doing a donut right next to the school, that, almost, that one's almost a no brainer. We just have to prove that that donut would work in that area or that roundabout work in the area, not just to prevent the donuts, but the safety of the pedestrians out there. So, and I know that's a throwing a lot out there for all these, but it, it, it goes to the fact that if we start with some, get some in and see where it goes, we can then attack the problem incrementally as we go along. We're not favoring somebody over another, but that's why the discussion has to be done within the neighborhood to say, yes, we know that we want this first because this is the best, biggest glaring problem. And it could be different factors. It could be somebody worried about their children going to school, or it could be someone walking because they work in the civic center or something like that. And that's something we'll, you know, together we can sit up and say, okay, this is what I can do for you today, tomorrow, two weeks from now, versus three or four or five months or a couple of years from now. It just depends. Like a signal takes years to get in. A stop sign, it just depends if we get that right picture. What I tell people is that you guys are living a movie. I live a picture. But I got to get enough pictures in there to get your movie so we can get this warranted. And that's how we work with it. We keep coming back, keep coming back and everything. So, um, you know, there's only like three full timers on my group, but we're pretty good about it. So, and we've worked pretty hard with it. So, um, and, and with that said, if you don't have a traffic committee, we'll take a look at these. If, if you're saying the possible solutions at the locations you've identified, then we can move forward with that and start working on those if you want. Um, but I would encourage if you do a traffic committee, it makes it easier for the traffic committee and neighborhood committee to interact. That way everybody knows what the priorities are. And then it makes it easier for me when I move forward, let's say to council and say, this is what I need money for. The neighborhood assigned a traffic committee. This is what the community wants. And this is what the neighborhood wants from this traffic committee. So it, it just gives it, gives it a little more oomph if you wanna call it that way. Um, it, it helps because then you get different people also involved and it doesn't put too much burden, let's say on the people that are here right now, all, you know, seven, nine, whatever are here, doesn't mean you have to get all that work doing it yourself either. And then the more people you involve, the more eyes, the more of a movie that we can put together for the neighborhood. No, thank, thank you. Yeah, definitely. We, we did start a traffic committee. Um, it's awesome. only about five folks, but, and we are planning to do more community outreach that tends to work best, like one-on-one. -on -one. We have another event coming up this weekend. Um, uh, Chris, it looks like you had a question or comment. Yeah, I guess in terms of next steps to uh, just uh, wanting to know if like, so I, I guess uh, it sounds like needing more voices and is that kind of uh, done through either surveys or is it done through like walk assessments or even just talking to people and kind of more finding out that more people have the same concern and does that help to actually basically push the solution forward if, if, if that's what's needed sometimes. Are, are you talking to me or, 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 or to you. From, from, my, from, from my standpoint, it, it does help because it, like I said, it, it, the analogy is not the greatest, but it is creating that movie because if I do a study and let's say we're talking and I do a study, you tell me Friday at two to three, but five or six people say, no, 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 it's actually Saturday from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., then I don't want to miss that because it just ends, we have to then go, okay, if we missed that one, then we got to go to this study. And I have limited resources. I have 20 some odd requests almost a day of all the neighborhoods in the city looking for something and then the traffic committees I'm dealing with. So I'd like to focus what you guys need 
and, and getting more people involved, getting understanding what that focus is, is the best way to do that. And, and how you go about it with, with the neighborhood, I'll, I'll leave that up to you guys. Like um, Irene mentioned, there's, there's another event coming up this weekend. Um, however you guys do that, the best fits your needs, that's, that's the encouragement. Um, it will encourage you to do that, definitely. Um, can I just add one more thing? I, sorry, I, I just wanted to, so I'm, I've, I've been having my resident hat on, but I'm also <laughs> going to put on my work hat a little bit. Um, so I work with an organization called Santa Ana Active Streets. Um, Irene's been involved in, in, in helping out with a lot of different activities. Um, but one of the kind of activities we actually do are um, walk assessments. So actually walking corridors to identify issues um, but there's a lot of other different kind of resources out there. Um, one of the things that Santana, uh, and this, I guess this is to the broader, um, the, the Willowick um, um, Neighborhood Association, is that um, the Santa Ana is considered a focus city, and it's a designation of seven cities um, in California that says that they have really high pedestrian and bicycle collisions. So it's, Santa Ana is one of those cities that have really those high rates. So um, there's this organization called California Walks. I just uh, dropped a link in here and they're a statewide pedestrian uh, advocacy organization. And so they have a lot of different tools. So if you wanna work on developing an, you know, developing an action plan or getting support of learning about different kind of um, ideas of solutions that could be possible or even doing uh, collecting data and you want support from an organization, they're another organization we work with and they work with neighborhood associations if that's something that you wanted to work on. So then talking about that data and getting those more voices, that's ourselves at SAS. And then I would imagine th this organization would definitely be willing to help y'all out in that. And I can, and I know we've worked with the city um, in those kind of partnerships and getting this, this kind of data and getting it to the city. And so we've definitely been appreciative of that. So I know it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good, way to possibly do things as well too. So I just wanted to offer that as a possible way. And I'm definitely for the future, if you want to learn a little bit more of the kind of data collection work in other neighborhoods that we've done, we can definitely present in the future. But yeah, just wanted to offer that, so. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, surveys and, and walk assessments is not necessarily the uh, in the, the wheelhouse of, of the Willard board. So we'd love to partner with you and, um, if you'd like to join our, our traffic committee, we definitely welcome it. Um, that, that was one of the main reasons too, we, we asked Mr. Ariano to join us is to g give some guidance as to some next steps, but I agree. I think we do need to collect some more information from the community. And um, I, I would ask though that we, we keep it to like, a, you know, a, some kind of time period. Like, I don't know if we could keep it to a 30 day time period so that in February, we have some kind of action plan or, or priority list at, at a minimum to keep this project moving and top of mind. Irene, I just, um, and Chris, uh, thank you for mentioning California Walks because um, they have also worked with other Santa Ana community-based organizations like KidWorks to engage youth in their neighborhoods. and being part of the um, solution and the recommendations for any kind of, to the city and other groups in terms of what kind of solutions could help improve the health, safety and well-being for, for everybody. And this is youth in that. So I'm sure we have a lot of youth in Willard and you know those tools will help further incorporate the voices of, of Willard into the priorities that Frank would need for the next steps. That's great. Okay, so on our end, um, just to recap, we will um, do a more formal meeting just with the traffic committee to help prioritize some of these areas. And then Chris, if you can kind of guide us as to um, whether it be California walks group or some kind of survey that we do um, as far as what are, what are some tools that we can use. And then I think the one-on-one the -on -one outreach will also be key. We, we have a, a unique opportunity with the Willard playground. There are always many community members there. We could do informal surveys there as well. When we were helping with the um, 
one of the surveys that the city was doing earlier in the year, we had the most um, traction with just the one-on-ones and uh, actually speaking to people. So I think for our community that works the best versus like mailing something home or anything like that. Okay. Um, I mean, also real quick with that, you know, if you want me to attend the, the your traffic committee meeting, okay, um, I can do that as well. That way um, we can walk through what some of the pitfalls we have. Because I know people might say, well, I need a signal right here, right now. Well, there's a lot of stuff that goes with signal. And then I can explain it to them. And that way they will learn the process that we have to go through. And then they can take it back to whoever they're representing in the portion of the committee for the, for the neighborhood. And so they can understand, okay, yeah, we can ask for all this, but we may not be able to deliver it because of the following reasons. But that doesn't mean, you know, we're not gonna try, we're not gonna go for it. It just makes it that educational component of what we have to do and how we have to go about doing it that makes it um, fruitful for us to be in the committee sometimes. If it's just something where you guys are just wanna discuss openly, that's fine. But if let's say if it's a stop sign, roundabout signal, Anything else, I can explain the process on each one of those individually. That way the committee members understand, okay, so maybe, okay, we'll have to narrow it down to this or we can expand it to meet all these other items. And it makes it easier that way to, for people to engage when they're talking to someone else instead of saying, oh yeah, I told you I wanted a signal. Well, yeah, we asked for this, but this is what's gonna take to get to that signal, what it's, taking, what it's gonna take to get to the speed humps. That way they realize, okay, so maybe we can work to that goal. And these are the steps we can take, low lying fruit type of stuff, and then get to that point. So if, if you guys would like me to attend, I can definitely do so. I think that would be great, definitely. So um, I will reach out about a date that works for everyone. And like I said, I, the goal is to keep this moving along and, and um, make this a priority for our community. So we'll look at an early January uh, meeting and then go from there. As far as some immediate steps, Mr. Oriano, could we look at that Washington Avenue um, pothole situation? I agree with Chris. Um, I've actually reported some severe potholes there and they will come out and patch them, but, but it's like, it's really, it's all patched up. It's more patches than it is actual asphalt. So what I can do there is I can meet with um, the design team that handles those kind of requests and everything. And, and ask them actually, okay, I know you're gonna put out some like skin patches as they call them and everything and do all that. Is there a project in the future of this, uh, of the neighborhood on that street? What's going on? And then I can at least report that back to you that it's either it's not on our radar, it is on our radar, or it has some kind of um, outdate of when we're gonna be able to do some repairs and everything. At worst, they say no. At best, then we can use that as something to our public works director to say, the residents out there are wanting this. We keep doing just the patches and we're having accidents for bicyclists, people you know, twisting their ankles out there and everything. We need to address this a little bit more uh, fervently than, than just saying skin patches and stuff like that. So it puts it on our radar for lack of a better term. It puts it on the people's radars that, hey, they're now coming to neighborhood meetings and talking to me, which I can't do anything about but I can go back to the people that can and ask them questions for it. So the nice thing about a senior engineer is once they give me an answer, I can go higher than them. So it makes it easier. So it's like, well, I'm not going to complain about them, but I'm going to say, do something about it to the, to their boss or someone higher. So, so yeah, that, that, that we I'll, I'll work on that right away and everything looks like that. The other question I had for you, I looked on some of these items were in the possible solution area. I can take a look at some of these, uh, like the speed pads on, on Parton and Ross, we can do studies for all those. Uh, the signs crossing at Halesworth, that one might be a little tough because we don't have an ADA compliant intersection on the west side. So those are the things we take a look at and everything. Um, some of the other things we don't necessarily do suggest a safe route to schools for um, charter schools. We're trying to get into that. The problem becomes charter schools by nature are, are, are uh, fundamental schools. So people drive to them. So it's hard to put a warrant of a crossing there that said all these kids are going unless we can get like some kind of census. And I know the principal there pretty well and I'm sure she'll be able to help us with that. Get some kind of census that says, these are the children walking from this area. That helps with um, 
the problem solving of say, okay, if we get enough children and if they cross there, then what do we do? What can we do? And is it safe enough to do something out there like that? Um, so we'll look at all that and I'll you know, lay out some of the problems with that. Um, right now being a T intersection, that might be a little bit of a problem. We might have to eliminate a lot of the parking um, to and from along Halesworth just so children can walk safely. But those are the things I'll point out, little bullet points, just at least to get you an understanding where we're at, what we can do, and if we were, what the impacts are to the local, uh, to the residency and the businesses located next to that intersection. So yeah, we, I can definitely work on those I got. And then also the ones on the four-way stops, um, we can start quick studies on those. Um, I think we might be able to get some in by next week, if possible. If not, then obviously the first week of, or the second week of January, when school's back in, we can start doing some of the studies. Okay, um, great. So we're, we'll, try to, we'll try to see if we can do that. As far as the roundabouts, those will be, uh, probably be asking, you know, we'll do the studies on that. But like, let's say the roundabout, I think uh, Ms. Bianca mentioned, part and tenth, right? Is that, if that's like one of the biggest priorities, we can take a look at that, sit down and see what the, the geometrics are. How much parking do we lose? How much can we preserve? How much, you know, effectiveness is it going to be? And if not, what other treatments can we do leading into the intersection that might prevent that problem and everything like that? So, and obviously we'll take into account the children crossing feds and all that other stuff that goes with that. So if that's where you want me to, one of the ones that you want me to focus on right now, I can do that right away and we can start um, working on that. So, um, you know, the list is not for not, it's just a matter of wanting to make sure that, you know, if this is what you want me to hit right away, we can do this right now and then come back at least with answers. I'm not gonna memorialize any of the studies so we don't sit there and, if I memorialize it and it doesn't go in our favor, then it's like, we have a, rules that we have to follow that we have to wait a certain amount of time. I won't do that. I'll share our preliminary findings and then we'll discuss through them and everything else like that. When maybe is it better to come back early February to study it, to see if we can see if that works better for the numbers so we can put it in. Um, right now being the holiday season, people are leaving or have left or, or getting close to leaving. They're not gonna be maybe traveling. They're not maybe out there as much and everything like that. So all those little things go into our decision-making and also into work. But some of these studies we can do and get some preliminary numbers and share them with them with everyone and say, is this what you guys are experiencing? Mm -hmm. And if not, okay, so then do we switch it over to a weekend or midweek or daytime, nighttime, whatever it is. Normally our studies, we'll try to do 24 seven in the middle of the week. We don't do them on the weekends, but if the weekend's the problem on some of these, let me know and I can just start those on the weekend as well. Okay. Why don't we collect a little more data? We'll try to get a meeting going with the traffic committee. But yeah, if we could start some studies, I think that will be a guiding force for us. Okay. And, um, I know we had even talked about filming things and and specifically that 10th and Parton area. I know there's like tire marks on the ground that, you know, <laughs> there's proof there of, of what's been going on. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you. This has been very helpful. And I, I feel like um, we're getting some traction here. And um, re really, I would just encourage all of us, anyone that else that is interested in being a part of the traffic committee, um, I will connect with each of you to, to see what time works so that we can keep this at the forefront. Okay. And, and if you, every anyone on, on the call right now or, or friends or neighbors, Go ahead and give them our information. If it's something they're seeing, the more information we get, mm -hmm. what I'd say is don't wait to tell the traffic committee. It's definitely tell the traffic committee, but tell us as well so we can document it all. And the more we document, again, that picture becomes more of a movie for us as well, too. So please encourage everybody to, to call us in. I know you get a lot of people that say, well, I call in, nothing happens. It, it may be true. It could be with PD. It could be with us that in that moment, we, it takes us time to get to maybe... Like, like I said, I use the signal as an example because everybody goes, I want a signal over here. And, and that takes months, years and to even get in, let alone to study and do all those other things. So, but I still encourage everybody to call us anything from like a little red curb. I can't get out of my driveway. 
that all the way to, again, I'll use the signal as the highest situational thing that we can place. So Frank, Frank what number should they call? Oh, um, please call me at 714-647-5614. That's your direct line, right? That's Frank? my direct line. There's no, <laughs> there's no way around that one. It's my direct line. Um, and then I, I guess if, can you post my, e my, my email address on there? Yes. Or no? yes. yes. Okay. Because my phone gets about 50 to 60 calls a day. And mm -hmm. then it filters into my team's call. So emails are the best way because that way I can forward it to whatever specific um, member that we have available. And then they can at least call the resident and say, got your information. Let me know more information and we can work out the details of what you're asking for. So that way they don't have to flood the committee with everything, but at least let the committee know that I called about this. And then we can share some of the results of that. Um, and that way it's being proactive on a daily basis and then on the larger picture with the community. Okay, that's great. And Frank, would would uh, we also reach out to you with parking? Parking was a, a again a very big concern with folks. Specifically, uh, there have been some new uh, issues with a lot of the renters, and you know, with the new ordinance paths with um, rent control, what, what we're noticing is that uh, folks' parking fees are going up versus a, the increase in the rents or, or people are signing up for a one bedroom apartment with zero parking. Um, so if there are parking concerns, would we also go to you as well with those? Uh, on those, um, it, it, there's nothing I can do what happens on site. If, if there are, let's say it's a pre-existing building or, or home and they've added like an additional, like an, uh, an accessory dwelling unit or additional units, I know those don't come with parking. That's one of our challenges, trying to find parking where there doesn't exist because of these ADUs. Um, I, it, it, the only thing is if planning and building are allowing these um, extra units to go in, or if, if let's say that the owner is allowing extra and renters to go in, there's nothing much I can do to control that. All I can do is uh, try to work with the aftermath of it, you know, by trying to create, get creative with some parking in the area but that resource is very limited. So um, a lot of times, if it is a permanent parking, which is most of Willard, um, these new people coming in will not get a, 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 a um, permanent parking sticker unless the owner says it's given to them versus the other person. So um, yeah, there's, there's not much, I, that's, I, 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 I'm involved with the aftermath of that, not necessarily what happens before or during the all the all the renting and everything and all the changes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know who else, Margarita, if you can think of someone else. I mean, our housing authority or or actually, yeah, that would be with with the housing division. So I know that they've hired um, a consultant that handles. They actually they they've done workshops, and so because it's new you know, for everyone, it might be helpful, Irene, even like just a separate um, informational, maybe inviting that person at a subsequent Willard meeting. And because there are a large number of renters in your neighborhood, I think um, even if you know some of the apartment managers, I mean, this would be a great opportunity just to see like, how was it going to affect me? Or, I mean, they at least to give an orientation of what to expect or how do you start, you know, to even understand how the program works. Okay, yeah, that, I think that's a great consideration. Um, and, and we know you, you can't just, you know, we don't have double parking or I, I've seen in New York where there's like one parking on top of the other, but there are some streets that Chris brought up a, a one that don't have any parking at all, um, like Broadway, 17th Flower, um, could, could one of those, even some of the perimeter of Willard uh, Intermediate, the, the, the perimeter doesn't have any parking at nighttime. So could some of those be a, a solution? They, they could be, we'll look at the details. Like the, along Washington, that north side, that might not be because of the, the spatial uh, dimensions of the street. Um, going around the corner, I know there's a restriction of overnight, no parking, and there's a lot of red curb North of that on 15th, 
that we've been talking to the school district saying, why do you need this red curb? Um, as well as why there is a restriction that the neighborhood requested of no overnight parking next to the school, which we've asked in the past to you know, get rid of, and it's been always pushed back by everyone. Um, the residents in are saying, no, now that we're talking to, let's say the, the neighborhood um, membership, that may be something where, look, the greater good said we need it, so we're gonna remove it now and make it work for the, for the, for the community versus just responding to the one person saying, I want parking, and then the other five or six people that live there saying, no, we don't want any, anybody parked over there at night. Um, so, and then we always have the safety component to that as well. You know, if I put parking out here, historically, you know, can PV be out there to make sure that those cars are safe? Um, you know, people are cars aren't being broken into and stuff like that. We'll talk about patrols with them to say, you know what, this is now open parking. Is it something we can manage or control? Like one of the ways we manage open parking so you don't get the 72 hour rule is that at 6 a.m. in the morning the next day, either you move your car or gets towed. So it has a little a recycling restriction at 6 to 7 a.m., no stopping any time. So you can park there up to 6 a.m. All right, you got your parking overnight, now you got to move. That way no one sits there for 72 hours or abuses the street sweeping rules or anything like that. Um, that's one way that we're proposing to keep the parking safe for the residents next to that parking. Um, but maybe I'll go through through the neighborhood association asking for, for permission to open that up. It has nothing to do with the, the school or anything like that. It's our own um, it's our own residency that makes that decision. So I'll put that on my to do list right now, and then um, I'll forward it to you and then say, okay, does the neighborhood agree with these these new changes and stuff like that? So there might be need some reach out for the neighbors along some of the stretches, but we'll talk about those, you know. And if you guys would like us to do it or you do it, um, either way, but at least we have the backing of the neighborhood to move forward with some kind of solutions like that. Okay. I know, um, and I don't know if, if this was just carryover, but when the Willard Intermediate Field was built, I believe part of that, um, the agreement was that parking would not be overnight along the field side because it was a lot of visit visiting um, folks using the field and to give the street super an opportunity to clean. And I actually live across from the Willard Field and it does need to be cleaned every night because there's just so much <laughs> trash. That's another uh, focus of ours is trash collection in our community. Um, but I believe that's why a lot of residents have felt that not having parking there overnight is the best, but possibly like a six to 7 a.m. rule that that could be a solution. Yeah, and it doesn't, yeah, you're right. And then people, when they leave after four days of being parked there, they, sadly, they dump their trash out and everything like that. So this will be something where it recycles the parking. Um, is I don't recall, there's gotta be a street, well, no, there isn't a street sweeping sign out there, is there? Yes, so you can park there until 2 a.m. Okay. And it, it gets, the street super comes every night. Okay, Yeah. so. Okay, we'll we'll work on the on the details of that. I'm trying to think of which way to best, and I'll, we'll have to talk to the street sweeping crew to find out exactly if we were to modify it to fit the parking needs. When can they go out there and and still do their their, their stuff? If it's two o'clock and thereafter, I don't think six to seven will hurt them to come out and do it then. But right. I'll check with them to make sure and everything else they got. So. Okay. Great. Well, any other comments before we wrap up? Irene, I just wanted to mention that I, I appreciate your level of organization and even um, capturing the feedback that you received at the cleanup and presenting it on a visual map, highlighting that. Um, it's very instructive and there's a parallel with the work that Frank does with his team in terms of the education involved in explaining the process and I think this just presents a very strong opportunity to um, engage residents of Willard even more than before to be connected with the processes and at the same time voice their concerns and then try to work out on whether it's these solutions that you've presented or even 
something that staff haven't, you know, incorporated or hasn't been presented before. So I just wanted to thank you and, and the board of Willard uh, for for doing always like keeping the voices of the residents in mind and finding ways, creative ways, cultural ways to engage them. It's very much appreciated. Well, thank you. We, we are learning along the way. And I think dialogue like, like we had today is, is very important and, and super helpful. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Frank. We'll definitely, we have your number. We have your email. <laughs> We won't overflow your your um, your voicemail, but we'll definitely send some email. I know a couple of um, neighbors had some specific parking questions, so I'll have them email you, um, and then we will follow up on some next steps with the traffic committee. And then, um, yeah, we, we look forward to connecting with you. Excellent, thank you, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It makes my job a lot easier, believe it or not. So. Oh, good. Okay, uh, just a couple more things to wrap up. I did want to share with everyone some photos of our neighborhood cleanup. So um, we started off at the beginning of 2020, every garage sale Saturday, having dumpsters out um, and letting neighbors know that if they had bulky trash, they could throw it out on that Saturday of garage sale. So one new thing that we implemented this uh, last Saturday, December 4th, is we did a, a, a quick cleanup day and it was, cool to see the kids. I mean, it, we, we just had a few kids, but it was cool to see them walk around the neighborhood. I think that we don't do that enough. Um, you know, we're, we're rushing to get to school or, or, or run errands, but to be able to walk the community and talk to everyone was very nice. Um, so just sharing some photos here and then reminding everyone that our next cleanup is Saturday, March 5th. So that's garage sale weekend. We'll have the dumpster there, but we're hoping to um, make this cleanup day and beautification day a, a little bigger. So definitely reach out if that's something of interest and uh, we will get that going. Lastly, super excited to share with everyone. You may have seen that there we have ice skating in Santa Ana. Um, very exciting. It's, it's, I think even cooler for us because it's within walking biking distance. Um, so it's right behind the courthouse, which is very near behind the library. And uh, there is parking there, but it is, they do charge for parking. So I do highly encourage Willard neighbors to walk there or bike there. Um, and the hours of operation are, are noted here, basically Monday through uh, Thursday from two to nine, Fridays and Saturdays, it's open a little longer. I did just get a note though, that because of the uh, rain and storm that's coming in, it will be closed tomorrow. So that's just something to note. And also um, I believe the fee to, for ice skating is $12, uh, but Monday for Santa Ana residents, it's a, a little bit less. And even just to walk the area, it's very pretty. They have, um, they'll have music, they have food trucks out there. Um, I took my son out there. I just got to walk around. So you don't have to be an ice skater to, to enjoy this area. It's very pretty. And I think they did just a really great job. Has anybody else been out there? Oh, Chris, did you ice skate? No, I, I don't want to hurt myself. So, but it was there. It was really nice. And everything. I was one, I think if I do go, I'm going to get myself on one of those seals and get pushed around and everything like that. So. Uh, we just hosted a bike ride recently where we did a little stop there. So yeah, we checked out the uh, opening when they were doing an ice uh, skating dance and I was like, cool. performance. Yeah, that was fun. Okay, well, highly encourage everyone to get out there. It's very cool. So our next meeting will be Monday, January 9th, uh, 6.30 p.m. We'll uh, do a Zoom meeting again. Um, just because of the winter weather, um, looks like there's some spikes of COVID um, that are happening in, in different parts of the community. So I do wish everyone a very happy holiday. Everybody stay healthy and, and safe out there. Please, please join us Saturday uh, for our event happening at St. Peter Church. And if you're available to volunteer, um, we welcome it. And I'll connect with uh, those that have raised their hand for the um, traffic committee, the more um, 
voices, the, the better. Um, so Chris, I'm, I'm super excited that you're joining that because I know you're, you're an expert in some of these things. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thanks, Liz, I see your note. Thank you for all your hard work. We're, we're excited for uh, what, what's to come for in 2022. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hi, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night.